This talk is about co-creation between UX and design. And to be honest, it's a little bit of a part two on what Tudor told us this morning about design thinking. So it's a little bit, it goes a step be like further or it continues from that point on. So that's a nice sequence, I would say. So let me go to the introductions. Um, first of all, I want to give a little shout out to the person not being here, but she worked so hard on this presentation and on the talk that we're giving, and that is Tamar Swart. Normally, she's my co-speaker, so normally we stand here together. However, she couldn't make it to Romania, so uh, you have to deal with me today. Um, she is the Global Director of User Experience Design of Adidas, and I am a Java and Kotlin developer uh, within Open Value. So from both disciplines, we added our vision and our perspective on things to this presentation. And I have always been very passionate or almost obsessed with making an impact. For me to get that satisfaction at the end of the day, it's very important that I see results. I'm a very result-driven person. Um, and to make an impact, often that led to a close collaboration between people that design things, so either designers or maybe front-enders. However, interesting is that whenever I switched companies or I switch teams, um, that time after time again, the discipline seemed to have quite a lot of struggles with getting that smooth collaboration right, with having an efficient way of working together, and maybe more importantly, an enjoyable way of, for all parties. So that is what this talk is going to be about a little bit today, so how can we smoothen out that process? Now, you might have heard it said that the what question is the responsibility of a product owner. So the product owner kind of decides what kind of product we are going to work on or what feature. And sometimes uh, we have product owners that are very involved and they really want to have a saying on how we are going to implement it. But most of the time, uh, we try to get them away from the how because that should be part of our team responsibility, right? We are the specialists. We know better how to make stuff. They can decide on the what. But interesting is, who is deciding on the why question? And I think that can be very divert. Like, the answers can be very divergent. Some might say that should be the MT or the CEO or like the, the, like the, the directors, they should have a vision and a mission of the company. They decide on the why. Maybe some of you say that the designers should have the saying on the why. They should have that user interaction, right? User research, um, maybe a PO. Maybe you say we should all have um, a saying on the why or we should have an answer to the why question. And with many things, um, it depends, right? But I want to make a small sidestep in order to elaborate a little bit on how I see it. Um, so this saying is uh, from Simon Sinek from his book, Start With Why. Uh, the QR code to that book can be found in the corner. Uh, and what he is saying is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And why you do things pro simply proves what you believe in. So that sounds very fancy, right? That sounds wonderful, but what does it really mean? Um, and in order to really understand it, I feel that the last sentence is the most important one. So what you do simply proves what you believe in. Now take a second to think about what you do on a normal day-to-day -day work uh, work day, from the moment that you wake up until the moment that you step into the office. So that period of time in between getting up out of waking up out of bed and getting into the office. What do you normally do? Some of you will maybe rush to the gym, go sport, and like they like to have that adrenaline before they start their work day. Some of you might have that quiet peaceful morning, have a little, have a coffee, enjoy a newspaper, just have that clarity of mind and the peace of mind before you get into your rush day-to-day -day work, right? 
Some of you might have family time. Uh, and others might put the alarm at the very last second, might rush out of bed, take a coffee to go, and rush to the office while eating a sandwich, right? And there's no good or bad. It just depends on what you value most. It just simply proves what you believe in. Do you believe in the value of having that clarity of mind? Or do you believe in the fact that you believe that your evening is the most valuable time of, of the entire day? So you want to spend your evening as long as possible, leading to the fact that you put your alarm as late as possible, right? Leading to the fact that you rush to the office, get your coffee to go, and your croissant or something. It doesn't matter. Just simply proves what you believe in. And you can take that to a work environment, right? Because people buy why, they buy your, your why. You need to, un oh, yeah, no worries. Oh, we are going to have a little tech. So, um, people are buying your why. So, you should think about, like, okay, for which user uh, group am I offering my product? Why do they want to use my product? Maybe I have an ordering system for takeaway, right? But am I targeting a group that just wants to have food very fast? Or am I targeting a group that cannot cook and they are willing to wait a longer period of time for their food, however they want to have quality food? It depends, right? And in order to visualize a little bit what happens if we don't have that image altogether, I want to give you a little bit of a storytelling example. So let's say we have this painter. The painter draws drawings, that's what he do, does. And at one point, a middleman is coming up to him and says, okay, I have this client, and the client wants to have a drawing of a forest. Now, that's perfect, he is specialized in, uh, in making natural drawings, so that, that's fine. He goes ahead and he makes his best piece yet. He is so proud of the result that he delivered. But when it gets to the customer, the customer is actually very disappointed. Because the customer is a person that really likes abstract art, and he would have expected something more like that. Next to that, the painting was actually meant to hang in the garden. But this painting has been made with water, water coloring, meaning that it only takes one rainy day for that entire painting to be destroyed. Now, you might already see the little analogies with IT, right? The painter being the developer, the middleman being a designer or someone that gives you the requirements, and the client being the user. Now, I see two things mainly happening here. On the one hand, we have a painter or a developer not knowing about their users, right? They don't know what the user likes. So that's kind of a problem. But you could argue, or you could say, okay, well, maybe the middleman didn't do his job correctly, right? Like, maybe the middleman should have told us that the client liked abstract art, like it's not our problem. It's the middleman lacking uh, to fulfill his role. However, that's not the only thing that's happening here. Because you could also, you also see a problem with the fact that the painting was meant to hang outside in the garden. But the middleman never knew about the toolkit of the painter. The middleman is not a painter. He doesn't know that you have different types of paint, that it can be watercolored, like oil-based, whatever in between. He doesn't know about that, so he didn't even think about giving that kind of information that where the painting was going to hang to the painter because it didn't seem relevant, right? And that is where we get into the multidisciplinary way of working. We cannot, because we are specialists, all of us are specialists, we cannot fully foresee the other specialities. So we need to collaborate in order to make that painting into a whole and to prevent a lot of gaps from happening. Now, when you, at a certain point in time, know why you are building a product or a feature, uh, and why you are doing that for a certain customer, that can also give you an insight of if you are in the right team to work for. Because 
the why gives you purpose, right? The why proves whatever you do. If you do things that are not aligned with your why, then probably you will not get a lot of satisfaction, you will get frustrated, an energy drain will happen, and in the end, you're the only one that's really having the issues, right? So if the why of why you are building your product does not align, it's better to see that in an earlier stage, right? And that doesn't mean, because I, I know I've seen tons of the other developers that say, I don't really care about an end user. I care about that my product is smooth and that it uses the new techniques and that it's quick and efficient, stuff like that. And I don't really care about what an end user uses it for. And that's fine. That's fine. We all have different perspectives on things, right? But that's also why we have different teams. Not all teams are involved in an end user, right? But if we have a product to deliver and we want to get the best product out there and we do reach the highest value, it's very important that we have this divergent team with different skill sets, different personalities to be able to fill in all those gaps. Now, as I said, it doesn't really matter that you might not really feel like working for an end customer. That's why we have different team structures. And of course, you can find online, you can find 100 different team structures. Uh, but to keep it a little bit minimalistic for here, uh, I've picked out the four that I think are most relevant for this talk. So first off, we have an operation team. And you can find different namings for this. But it, it, what the point is, is that this team maintains and improves the IT ecosystem. They don't report or deliver a product directly to an end user. Maybe they do deliver centralized solutions for other IT teams, that could be, uh, but they are not directly reporting to an end user. As you can maybe see, you always all see these people with the laptops, right? There are not really developers in this team because it's not that relevant for their team. So if you are drained by the meetings with developers or with designers and you are drained by going over user flows and, and on visualizations, maybe this is a better team for you. Maybe you will get more satisfaction with a team that purely focus on the IT ecosystem, right? And that's fine. But if you like to look at a business flow, then maybe the process team is something more for you. So a process team is a team that maintains and improves an entire business flow from front to end. And it's very important that we have people here that are specialized in user research and putting that into a picture. So in this team, you can find both designers and developers, and they are both participating in answering that why question, right? In, in making a product that delivers an answer to the why of the customer. Now, another team that you can have is a feature team. And you can see that the structure is a little bit different here. So on top, you see a team of designers. And they are responsible of making that entire business flow work. They are, they are there to answer the why of the end user. Now, below that, you will find multiple feature teams. And every feature team is responsible for one or multiple features. Interesting here is that they probably will have multiple users, right? We say you see here now one design team, but probably there are multiple business flows that are using the features of a feature team. So you need to have quite a clear vision on why you are making that product in order to see if that fits with the why of the design team. It doesn't necessarily mean that you always need to change your why. It doesn't need to be that it's always aligned. But if it's not aligned, then you probably need another team, right? Because otherwise, people will get disappointed with the end result. Now, as you can see here, you see the dotted lines. And they are kind of visualizing this little connection between the design team and the feature team. We recommend to have a SPOC system. So that means single point of contact. And that is that within that design team, you have one dedicated person that is attached to your team that knows about the why of your team and that you can have this smooth collaboration with. 
Now, last but not least, we have the project team. And the project team is actually a temporary team. It's a team that only delivers a product and hands it over after it's been implementing and not really maintaining it. Now, that can, and that product can be handed over to a, either a process team or to a feature team. It doesn't really matter. What is important here is that you need to keep, keep on checking in with the why of the team that you're delivering for, because how often has it happened or how often does it happen that a project team is working for months on this, this solution, and when it's delivering it, the team is not happy, they are actually angry, like, why did you do that? Like, it's just lazy, uh, your code is not optimal, stuff like that. And all the parties are disappointed. The team that works for months their ass off is disappointed. The team that gets the product to hand it over is disappointed. It's not really fun for anyone. So also keep that a short line between that team and the designer of that team to check in if the why is still aligned. Now, here you can see a little summary of what I just described. And for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on the last three teams, right? Because this team is about collaboration, so it would be a little bit weird if I would focus on the first one. Um, so with that in mind, we can start a collaboration, right? But to be honest, it's not that smooth as I said. I've had a lot of concerns myself during the last couple of years, and I've heard a lot of concerns around me. So a couple of concerns that I've heard or raised myself can be found here. They have to do with the fact that we already have too many meetings, especially during and after Corona, the meetings have grown tremendously. Now, it all, has also to do with responsibilities. Nowadays, a lot of people um, have to cope with burnouts or with stress. Um, adding an extra responsibility or an extra task package can feel like a burden, right? It can also have to do with the fact that you don't really understand each other. So if you're in a refinement together, it might feel that you're talking Chinese, like it's, it, that you don't get your message across, and it can be draining as well. Now, all of these concerns are valid, and I don't think it makes you a bad person programmer if you raise those concerns because it's actually making the way to get to an enjoyable way of working together. So I hope with like the talk I will get those concerns a little bit out of the way. If you're not fully convinced, please find me after the talk because I love to have a chat about it. Now the process, because we're going to talk about how we can make sure that those responsibilities and those meetings and everything that we need to do and have on our plate can be still managed. Now, this is where normally Tamar would really step in. Like this is, she would talk, uh, talk uh, to us about the design thinking and about all their processes. But luckily, I have had Tudor that already had the design thinking uh, presentation. Didn't know about that, but that makes it really smooth for me. So <laughs> I don't really need to talk about this very extensively because uh, he already did for a uh, a big part. Um, so they have this whole process where they validate and, yeah, well, different things, make prototypes, uh, do research, uh, user research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we also have a process that probably most of you guys will have seen: the DevOps cycle. Quite familiar, right? And it's interesting because a few years back, those cycles, the dev and the op cycle, were isolated, right, in most of the companies. So you were either a dev or you were an ops. And at a single point in time, suddenly companies decided we're now going to make it the DevOps cycle and you're going to get both of the responsibilities into one team. Good luck with it. And that's why I think most of us are a little bit scared of the fact that we get now another thing added to it. Because we thought of like, how can we collaborate those design things into one? And we came up with this beautiful triangle. But you might already feel like a little bit of a heart rush. Maybe your breathing goes a little bit quicker. Like, oh, man, is that now also part of my day-to-day -day, uh, task, uh, task package? Well, yeah, and no, kind of, it depends. So 
what we looked into is where we should find the collaboration. And we came with this triangle and collaboration map. So everything where you see a little bit of pinkish, there, those are the points in time that we feel collaboration would be very beneficial and helpful for the end product. Now, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily always responsible for that part, right? Because we still believe strongly in disciplines. We believe in specialities, the fact that you maybe studied for years for this profession. We don't take that away. So you still have your own responsibility within your own cycle. However, you do have an end responsibility of the entire product. So if you deliver something and it's on production, and it's not being used or it's having a lot of issues, then it's the responsibility of the entire team. Because the entire team was working on it throughout each cycle. So if it's a bad design, if people are not using it, it's also a responsibility of the team, right? Because you were there in the meetings to challenge it. If your code doesn't work, it was also a little bit of the responsibilities of the designers because we ask them to collaborate in the test and the validate phase. It's not their main responsibility, but it is a shared end responsibility that you deliver a product with value. Now, that hopefully takes away a little bit for the responsibilities, but you can still have that issue with the too many meetings, right? Too many meetings. I hear that a lot around me. I hate them as well. And they have grown, as I said, during Corona or COVID. Um, to be honest, that's true. And we should address that, definitely. But I don't think this talk is necessarily to talk about the many meetings that we have. Because I think that's a whole new topic with the fact that nowadays we don't really have efficient meetings anymore. The fact that we have that many remote meetings and the fact that we're all participating in a meeting while also working on our code base or while also checking our meals really makes the meetings inefficient and leads to more meetings or longer meetings. So, but that's a different story. So I don't think we should bash the fact that we don't want to work with designers because it will lead to more meetings. We need to talk about how to make those meetings efficient and worthwhile. Now, if we would do that, then hopefully we get to one point where we don't need to be frustrated about all the disciplines working on different islands and not really understanding each other. And for that last part, I want to talk about the details because we still have that issue of getting each other, right? Of really having the same vocabulary, speaking the same language. Now, during each phase, we have different tools that you can use in order to get each other. We start with the design cycle. And funny thing, you can see in the middle that the plan phase is entirely pink. That is because we believe that with every cycle, you should have this little check-in with the entire team to know where we are or where we are starting from to get everybody on board and to have a shared vision of that why. So also when design is starting in the very, very early stages with empathizing, there should be a little meeting about why they are going to empathize in, in which direction. Now, from that point on, the designers are going to take a little bit the lead, right? They are in their cycle, so they're picking up on the empathize and ideate phase, and they're going to conduct in user research. Now, that is their share of the deal, right? However, I would say, if you are in a product team, if you are delivering directly your product to end users, it is very interesting to see your end users at least once a year, just to go with them for once and see what kind of users are using your products uh, and to check it out. It's not mandatory, but I think in general, it gives you a good feeling of why you are building the product and to really feel that it, your code is more than just code. 
Now, from the user research, they're going to make a journey map. And a journey map is like this user journey throughout different phases. Um, and there you have different points of contact uh, where a user has contact with your system, right? They are going to map them out, and they're going to make this little map also about the lighter. So what is already there? So what is the product that's already in production, which is already live? And what are the delighters? What are the pain points? And what are the opportunities? Now, interesting is that for each pain point, we need at least seven delighters in order to phase out that one single pain point. So it is very important that we focus on pain points. However, don't stare into that blindly, right? Uh, to, if you have a very, very good opportunity, um, then that might increase your value as well. Just be aware of the pain points and that they do sometimes more harm than good. If they have mapped this out, right, then at one point, you can go to, a to an opportunity map. And now, this is funny to me, because a lot of times, we as developers are not really part of this acquisition of making this opportunity map. A lot of times, we get delivered by a product owner, OK, what we are going to do, we're going to pick up mm, that, this opportunity. This is what we're going to do. And the interesting thing is, how did they get to this diagram? Based on what information were they able to fill in this diagram? I get that they have a vision on the value. They probably work closely together with the designers. So they know about value. But they need import from the developers, right, to have a saying about the effort and to be able to make this into a big map. That is also why I think the collaboration should happen, because how often has it happened that somebody came up to us with a request saying, OK, do this really tiny, eeny, meeny thing for me, which took like two months. Or the other way around, like somebody saying, oh, I have this very, very big project, but I don't think we can make it, so probably leave it alone, but it's this or that. And you said, I can do that in two hours. Like, it's not a problem at all. It's like this mini thing. We need to have the collaboration in order to make this. But let's say we collaborate on this. We've all heard this talk now, so getting back to the companies, we're going to collaborate. And we pick one of those opportunities which we are going to work on. Now, how can you make sure that everybody speaks the same language? Most of the time, that's true visualization, right? To get out of our vocabulary or out of our code base and make things visual. Seems like an open door. But one of the tools that you can use for that is event storming. Now, this is not a talk on event storming, so I place a little QR code in the corner. If you are interested in this, go find more details for yourself. I will just cover the basic, but it's like this whole uh, tool that you can use. So event storming works best, <laughs> hold on tight, if you're physically with each other. I'm so sorry. I know we all love remote working and working from our laptops. And this can be done through tools like Nero and stuff, like you could do it online. But I highly encourage you to do it physically in the office. Close the laptops. Stop the distraction and get out those sticky notes. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to place events. And you're going to place a start event and a stop event uh, at both sides of the wall that you're working on or anything. And then everybody in the team, doesn't matter which discipline you are, are going to participate in the events that are happening in between. And it can be anything. Actually, I encourage you to think outside the box. Think of the crazy stuff, right? Because we're still in the design phase. It doesn't matter. It's good to think outside the box. Maybe we come up with these new innovative ideas, right? So you're going to do that. You're going to do it in past tense because an event has happened. Uh, and when you've done that, you're going to add the commands. So what led to that event? Uh, after that, you're going to put like triggers. So did a user trigger this? Or was it a cron job? Or anything that you can think of. You add some conditions. And when you're all done, you're going to see what kind of domains or event storming calls it aggregates 
we're having. And this is quite important because this is where semantics or vocabulary really comes in. How often have we had conversations where we both talked about a user and you were talking about a user with certain fields and the person that you're talking to has actually a very different idea of that same user that holds different data. Now, it can very well be that the user in domain A only holds a name and an email address, right? Because nothing else is needed. However, the user in domain 2 can maybe also have an address and a banking account because at that point in time he filled that in and now the user has been expanded. So it's important that we know what user we are talking about and in which domain we are talking about it. So if you're doing that, it could look a little bit like this. This is an example of me, my team in, in like another company. Uh, it's quite fun to do. Um, so that's one of the tools. If you've done that, then probably out of that event storming came like multiple ideas, right? Because I encourage you guys to think outside of the box because there's, so there's probably not one solution that came out of that. So the designers are going to see, okay, we pick this opportunity and what kind of the solution directions do we now have for that problem? Now they are going to document that and they are also documenting what we're not using. And we do that because nowadays we switch companies quite often, right? So if we get back to it in a year and somebody says, oh, I have this great idea, can we not do this or that? then at least we can look back and say, oh, we didn't do that by then because blah, blah, blah. But maybe now it's a great idea because we don't have that concern anymore. So they're, uh, they're part of that. And from that point on, they're going to create wireframes, maybe prototypes. They're going to validate, go back and forth um, until they have one prototype or wire, one wireframe that they're happy with and that they want to be, ex let be executed by the developers. Now, they make this blueprint with all the actions, and then we get into the picture, or we already were, right, because we collaborated, but we're doing our speciality thing here, the coding part. So, these technical designs and documentation I'm not going to ask you because it's like a, this negative question and nobody likes to give negative answers, but I will, I will just say it about myself. I think I've written more technical designs when I was finished with code than before I start coding. I think in general, I, I try to do it differently nowadays in like the last couple of years, but especially in the beginning of my career, I was, I was just doing it at the end because I kept on changing it. So like, let's do it at the end, at least we know what it is. <laughs> um, and that, it, it kind of works. Like, it, of course you have like this, this uh, reality documented uh, base. However, if you make it at the end, you take away all the opportunities co to collaborate. So making a technical design up front will give you the opportunity to have input from designers and to get feedback on that and maybe already prevent a couple of cycles or a couple of iterations where you need to go back and forth from your code base. Now, some of the tools that we use for technical designs, you might all have seen it. Uh, process flow, sequence diagram, and entity relationships. The process flow is, I think, most commonly known and used. It's like this flow. It looks a little bit like the event storming, right? But this is a little bit more in detail. I would recommend make this in a refinement session, like let this be the refinement session instead of let this be made by one developer. Uh, because then you also already have the input and you could also ask the designers to join that refinement because the fact that it's visual makes already a big difference for them in order to think along. Now, that same thing goes for sequence diagrams. Can I see some hands? Who has used sequence diagrams in the past? Like, uh, who has used them? Okay, okay, quite, quite a lot. About well, 50%, I would say. So that's great. Uh, and who, how many of you guys show those to your designers? <laughs> None. <laughs> okay, well, that's, 
Great, great. That, that gives me food to talk about. So uh, I actually think that this is a great tool to also show to your um, designers. And why do I say that? That's mainly because designers think most of the time that the back end it starts here and everything that comes after it is a black box. Like they have no idea. Probably they don't even know how many different entities or different applications or services or databases are being hit. It's just like, okay, I want this from the back end and then something is returned. But when they see this picture, they can get a sense of how many systems are since are involved and they can think along like okay do we actually need that much information in one single request can we maybe split it up can we maybe make three endpoints instead of two or one in, to make it like less vulnerable and less error prone you could also talk about the flows because if you make your sequence diagram you can talk about like okay what should happen if someone cancels the shopping cart should we be redirected to the home page or blah blah that could have come out of the designs of course out of the wireframes but this is a good checkup if everybody was on the same page same goes with error flows right like do you want me to return a hard error or should i actually like handle it in a different way and send back a 200 response or any other information. And last but not least, you can fill in the gaps. Like if you're making a sequence diagram and you don't know what to do, then that would be a great opportunity and gap to talk with your designer on how you are going to proceed from that. Now, we also have entity diagrams. I think nowadays with all our code base, uh, code editors and stuff, we don't use the entity diagram that much enti anymore because you can generate it, right? But I do think if you're not making it, but you're generating it, it's good to talk about because with security and having as less state as possible in our system, it's good to challenge if data is really needed uh, to, to save you to your system. I'm going to hurry up a little bit here because I don't have that much time. Um, so we have then the code and implementing part after all those designs, right? And it's good that with the test phase that the designers come in again and verify the product that we've made as a team. Are they still happy? If they have new requirements, don't get me wrong, we should prevent scope creeps. I'm not saying, okay, that's great, like we work together, then immediately we just, like we, we take the sprint and, uh, and we take another sprint and we, we deal with that as well. But you can make that into a new iterative cycle, right? And if you really find bugs, well, bugs are bugs, right? They should be solved. Now, at that point, we get to the release and the deploy phase. And we could just put it to production. That's, I think, what most of us do, which is fine. Uh, but if you're working closely together with a designer, you have other options. You could think about A-B testing, so putting it out there for partial part of the, of the client base. You could also have beta testing, which means that you're only getting the product out there for family and friends, maybe, or like a small known group. And then something that I think we pay too little attention to. The monitoring phase. Most of the time, we just do that by the side, right? A lot of times, we don't have user stories on our backlogs to monitor this. We are lucky if we have somebody in the team that finds this important, and then hopefully we get, a, like, we get an alert or a dashboard. But maybe we should also refine this. Maybe we should include the designers and not make our dashboards or our alerting only about errors but also about input on how the system or the product is actually used and how it's going to help us with a new iteration. And from that, we will get into a new cycle, right? It will, it's this continuous loop of the triangle. With that being said, I want to have a quick rest to look at the takeaways because it was a lot and I've talked quite fast. Um, but what I wanted you to take away from this talk is that look at the team, look at your why, because an individual, a successful individual is not necessarily a successful team. Be sure that you are aligned with what you believe in, especially for yourself. Um, incorporate design into your development cycle and make that a shared collaboration. The responsible of the end product lies with the entire team. However, the responsibility of specific steps remain to the discipline 
that it originally was meant for. If you want to do this, you also need to trust your teammates because you don't want to micromanage every, every step of every discipline. You also need to let go. You need to find a tool that will help your team. And probably this is not a one size fits all. You need to find something that helps your team. Uh, but it's an iterative process. So see what works for you and use visualization. And last but not least, give proper attention to your operator cycle because that will give you the input of a new cycle. Now, these were some of the tips and the resources that we've used. And with that being said, I'm not going to pronounce this. <laughs> All right, that was my talk. <laughs> I think we're pretty through the time, and then we should continue, I think. Uh, if you have questions, I'd love to have a talk with you. Uh, catch me after uh, somewhere in the hallway, and uh, we can have a chat about it. All right, thank you so much.